I understand the volume case for Alvin Kamara, but the problem is, is like everything else outside of the volume case. And I know he's going to look good in projections, but it's a tough case to be made, man, for me. Like this year, it's just, I look at him as being last year or previous seasons, Leonard Fournette at this particular juncture of his career. And people might think that's harsh. Like he's still very, very good through the passing game, but we've seen over multiple seasons, Alvin Kamara's efficiency numbers just continually keep on dropping. I mean, amongst 49 qualifying running backs last year, he was outside the top 35 running backs in explosive run rate, yards of contact per attempt, and missed Tucker's force per attempt. If Kendra Miller is healthy this season, I think he's going to eat into this backfield more than anybody wants to, to acknowledge right now, especially Kamara going as a top 20 running back in drafts and ADP. I'm going to make sure that I'm behind ADP on him and behind consensus because outside of the volume stuff, it's just a tough case for me to really get behind, man, because that's what's really pumped him up. Not the tackle breaking, not the efficiency. The cliff comes for these running backs very quickly, and it could come for Alvin Kamara in 2024. And that's without even discussing the downgraded offensive line, which the Saints offensive line is, it could legitimately be a bottom five unit this year, and it would not surprise me as at all. Like, they were only 17th in adjusted line yards or adjusted yards before contact per attempt last year. That metric is going to look worse this season. Yeah, I think it's a, a good call. Kamara is somebody that I didn't really have a particularly strong opinion about going into kind of the early stages of draft season, but I have definitely found that he is not somebody I'm going after aggressively. He's not even somebody I'm really taking at cost. He's somebody I'm only considering if he starts to drop a bit. Fitz, what are you doing with Kamara this year? Um, I'm kind of with you guys, and I've been struggling with whether to rank Kamara or Aaron Jones higher. I think Debro has uh, made the case. I have to double check that, but I think I do need to have Aaron Jones higher than Kamara. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, he's been really efficient, inefficient as a runner the last couple of years. Debro makes a good point about that offensive line, especially if Ryan Ramchek can't play this year or, or stay healthy. Um, that could be a really bad offensive line. So I agree. He's sort of, I think there's a big shelf where you go from like the Isaiah Pacheco, Kenneth Walker tier down to like the Aaron Jones, Camara tier. Maybe Aaron Jones should be up closer to Pacheco and Kenneth Walker, mm -hmm. but I do think there's a drop off um, to Camara. And I never really want to be drafting a guy at the top of the tier like that anyway. So he's a guy I will be drafting around this year. So Fitz, you, you talked about maybe possibly dropping him a bit in ECR he's RB 17 uh you know Aaron Jones is one behind him the next couple of guys after Jones David Montgomery Ramondre Stevenson James Connors Zabir White is he behind those guys for you as well I have uh Stevenson higher but I I Same. do have Kamara higher than those other guys right now yeah and I know Debra you're high on Zamir White yeah so he would I've got be higher than Kamara as well Zamir Mondre and Aaron Jones immediately ahead of Alvin Kamara and I have him Alvin Kamara actually he's in my tier four so those other guys are in tier three for me like I've got Kamara at RB19 so pretty uh you know lined up between the three of us on Kamara the next running back we'll be discussing we are not going to agree on Fitz I'll let you make the case before I disagree with you and I believe Debra will probably disagree with uh -oh. you as well yeah since we were bringing up my beer consumption earlier worm I mean you know what Wisconsin natives like to do when they drink a lot of beer one of their favorite pastimes they like to go cow yeah. tipping so no. um <laughs> let's let's Is tip really some a sacred thing? cows Is it a thing because I need to know this like do people that, really that do is, that a lot? I'm from a more urban part of Wisconsin, but in the rural parts, that is occasionally a thing that people do. Oh, after, man. Uh, I just get Tommy Boy flashbacks every time somebody <laughs> brings it up, man. That's not mud, buddy. That's not mud. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's tip some sacred cows on this show. And uh, one of the ones I will try to push over is Derek Henry. Ah! And a, a lot of people are excited about him going to the Ravens, especially Ravens fans like Worm here. Um, but like, no question, upgraded offensive ecosystem for Henry and exciting to think about what the Ravens offense is going to look like with Henry pairing with Lamar Jackson. But 
I do think we're whistling past the graveyard a little bit with Henry's age, ignoring the fact that he's 30 and will turn 31 before the end of the season. Um, And this is a guy with just over 3,000 career touches, if you include playoff games. There have been high mileage, older running backs who, you know, have just tumbled over that age cliff at 30 or 31. Eddie George, who was another high volume Titans back uh, from years gone by. Jerome Bettis. Uh, So Eddie George did have a a 1,000 yard rushing season at age 30, just barely, but then moved on to Dallas at age 31, uh, completely fell apart. Jerome Bettis had his last 1,000 yard rushing season at age 29 and then kind of disappeared. He went from 4.8 yards per carry to 3.6 the next year. Other guys have gone over the age cliff at age 29, like Sean Alexander, Marshawn Lynch, Arian Foster, all had a sharp decline in their age 29 seasons. Not to say every high mileage 30-year-old running back is a huge age risk. We've seen Emmett Smith. He had 3,000-yard seasons when he was in his 30s. And uh, in 20, let's see, 20, 2004, exactly 20 years ago, Curtis Martin at age 30 had 1,697 rushing yards, a career high. So not automatically a death sentence for his productivity, but I mean, we're getting into dangerous territory here. Also, he just hasn't been as efficient a runner the last couple seasons. In 2020, he led the NFL in rushing yards over expected uh, with 367, according to Next Gen Stats. Just crazy efficiency. The last three years, his rushing yards over expected by year plus 25, plus 87, plus 84. So it's dwindling a little bit, his rushing efficiency. And we need him to be a really efficient rusher because we know he's not going to do much as a pass catcher. I mean, Worm, I hope Derrick Henry smashes for the Ravens. I really do. He very well could. But there is, uh, you know, a, a degree of risk I think we should acknowledge. And I'm not sure a lot of fantasy managers are fully acknowledging it. So obviously I want to hear from Debro because I know that he <laughs> lines up more with me than you, Fitz. Um, but I, what I want to say on to your last point is uh, I don't think he needs to be uber efficient to be effective. And I know he doesn't contribute in the passing game. I just don't see – and we've said it a thousand times on the show. I don't see any way he scores single-digit touchdowns if he stays healthy all season. I mean, he can take a step back in efficiency and be Gus Edwards, who still had 12 rushing touchdowns in this offense a year ago. And I think there's a chance this offense is better than it was a year ago. The pass catchers are slightly worse, but Lamar's dropped a lot of weight. I think it's, you know, it's year two in Todd Munkin's offense. I think there will be touchdown opportunities aplenty, and I think that the first option every time they are close to the goal line is going to be Derrick Henry. I, like I've said before, if he stays healthy, I would put his touchdown total closer to 15 than I would to 10. It's at 10 and a half right now on DraftKings Sportsbook. Uh, And I don't feel, you know, there are definitely players where, if I make the case for them on the Ravens, it might be me being a homer. I don't feel like this is one of them. I just feel like it's very obvious that he, that the floor is such because of the what I assume will be the rushing touchdown equity. And you can't guarantee that for everyone. I think you can pretty much guarantee it for how they want to use him here in this offense. It's going to be so high that even with a slight step back you know, in terms of efficiency, I think he's going to be really good. And I also don't know that we're going to see that step back in efficiency because, I mean, it, he's on a great winning team, great organization. This organization knows how to develop offensive linemen. I'm not that concerned about the unit. So for all those reasons, I'm like really excited to take Derrick Henry like midway through the third round where you can get him in ADP. Um, to me, that's a total smash. Debro, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I was I was full of, of shock and horror when Fitz said the name. But, I mean, I, I understand the case and the age and all that kind of stuff. I mean, for me, it just comes down to Derrick Henry. I'm not, I'm not betting against the man anymore. Like, I understand, but I feel like we've been making the same case for the last two to three years, even before he hit age 30. And it's like, well, he's age 28, and he does it again. Well, he's age 29, and he does it again. And I'm like, I just, I'm not betting against him at this point. And we've seen some of the drop off from the efficiency metrics, but still among 68 qualifying running backs last year, this man was still ninth in explosive run rate and 11th in yards after contact per attempt. So like still a top 12 player and a lot of tackle breaking metrics that I care about. Tennessee's offensive line was bottom five last year. They were terrible. The one thing that, and I'm not saying that Baltimore or Lamar is going to just start, all of a sudden just start checking down the running backs and Henry is going to get 80 targets, whatever. I'm not, I'm not saying that. But I do think that 
because I, I everybody we all talk about it. Well, Derrick Henry is not going to play on passing downs. I, I kind of wonder, and the more that I've thought through as the off season's gone through, with when we 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 discuss that in his pass game role, I'm not saying that the guy is going to be CMC. He's going to play 80, 90 percent of the snaps. But the other thing about it is Derrick Henry was typecast into that type of role in Tennessee. I don't know if we can take the same thing and put him in the same exact bucket in Baltimore. And does that mean, am I saying that he's going to get a 15% target share? Am I saying that he's going to get 80, 70, 60 targets? Probably not. But I do think he could be the guy that's out there on passing downs more than, I mean, good Lord, what's behind him? It's Justice Hill and whoever else. Like, I think that, and Derrick Henry has shown throughout his career, he is a very good pass protector. The numbers stand up on that. And also, his receiving numbers over the past two seasons have been quietly impressive. Like, amongst all guys with at least 20 targets, 11th and 14th in targets per route run. He was first and seventh in yards per route run over the last two years. So, I think we could be underrating what Derrick Henry's just role is on passing downs. And while that might not equate to 60, 70, 80 targets, it might equate to 50. If that's the case, then a reception total like that, I mean, he could set new career highs and receptions this year. And I'm not saying that it blows everybody out the water, but it also adds on top of what we think he's going to do on early downs. Yeah, it, there may be some juice, you know, left to be squeezed in terms of the the passing game. You're not drafting him for that. It might just be mm -hmm. like, hey, it's not a zero like it has been in some years. For I mean, To me, you're <laughs> drafting him for two reasons. It's the touchdowns that I already mentioned, and it's the fact that running backs playing in the backfield with Lamar Jackson are basically gift-wrapped a five-yard per carry average uh, historically. I, so I to me, I just think he's going to be so good rushing the ball, given the offense, even if he is a worse rusher in a vacuum than he has been at the height of his career. I just think it, the situation is set up so nicely um, that it's going to be really hard for him to not live up to where he's going. It's not like he's going in the first round. Fitz, do you think that, I mean, like, yeah, it would be an outlier for a 30-year-old running back to be as good as I expect Derrick Henry to be, but when I look at every player in the NFL, the most physical outlier I can think of is pretty much Derrick Henry. So if I'm betting on somebody to be that outlier, it would be Henry. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's fair. And I, I can only fade him so much. I think I've got him at like RB9 or RB10, um, which is, I, I think, it, that feels like it's showing him the proper respect. But at the same time, it's kind of in a spot where, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not necessarily getting a lot of him in drafts. Just, just to mention and, and real I, fast here, Derrick Henry said back to back these last two seasons have been the highest uh, as far as receptions and targets of his entire career. And, and the, the last thing I'll say is I do think to the point about the, the, the topic of today's show, think twice before drafting these players. If I'm having to sit there like, you know, late second round, I probably am thinking twice. And I'm thinking, am I really going to take a 30 year old running back with the second mm -hmm. round pick? But again, if he's getting into that third round territory and I've already got two studs I feel really good about, to me, that's when I'm not thinking twice. That's when I'm just immediately clicking draft and, and laughing all the way to the bank. Uh, let's go on to the next running back here. Debra, who's your other running back that you're maybe avoiding this? Year? It's DeAndre Swift. Um, I just look, we've saw, we saw last year that Chicago deployed this three-way committee. You never knew who was going to get touches. And I think with the contract that Deandre Swift was given this off season, we're all like, Oh, well he's going to get all the work. And it's like, even when Deandre Swift has gotten all the work, it's not like it's been massively impressive. Like last year, weeks two and three, which were just monster, stupid, ridiculous games that were, if you look at the totality of last year, what he did as the Eagles starting running back, those two games were outliers. Because after those two games, the rest of the season, we're talking about DeAndre Swift. He averaged 16.8 touches, not even 75 total yards per game. He was the RB25 in fantasy points per game. And his tackle breaking metrics weren't great either. Amongst 49 qualifying guys, we're talking about a running back that was 30th in yard and missed tackles force per attempt, 40th in yards after contact per attempt. So it's like we're putting a lot of, okay, well, Swift is going to be an RB2. Maybe there's some upside there in the belief that he's going to be the definitive guy and he's going to be good. And I think both of those things are a much more shaky ground 
then a lot of us are willing to give it credit. Now, in saying this, do I have DeAndre Swift as an RB2 in my ranks? Yes. Am I going to draft him as much as other people in drafts versus wide receivers, other players that are going around him in ADP? No, because I'm really worried about him holding onto this role. I'm worried about him being just this locked in RB2 where it's like, uh, Erickson's brought this up on numerous shows. Like, what if Roshan Johnson eats into the goal line work because he's bigger? What if Khalil Herbert, who, how many seasons have we seen Khalil Herbert just be really stinking good at football? What if he eats into the early down stuff and they're like, we want to keep Swift fresh and he's not getting all the goal line work. He's not getting all the passing down work. There's a lot of worries here. And I don't know if we're fully baking all of that into his price where he goes and drafts. I think you're spot on. And, and the, point you're making that I agree with most is that like I don't know that it necessarily would make sense to drop him in the running back rankings like I could think back end RB2 is probably the right spot to be ranking him it's just where he's going I'm more likely to take oh I waited on quarterback so I'm going to take my guy here or I want to take a swing on one of these wide receivers here it's the guys at other positions that I'm just in like happy to target more than I am Swift where you have to take Swift Fitz where are you ranking DeAndre Swift right now I believe I've got him at RB20. Um, Debro, do you have DeAndre Swift or David Montgomery ranked high? So I'm, I, as we're talking about this, and I was looking at where I was versus consensus, I wanted to be at consensus or lower. So ECR is at RB24. I had Swift at RB20. I just bumped him down to RB24. And David Montgomery, I have him at RB23. Okay. Yeah, I feel like those guys, although the profiles are pretty different, I feel like they're pretty similar in value. Um, I agree with a lot of what you said, Debro, and also just the fact that two organizations now, the Detroit Lions and, and Philadelphia Eagles, have just sort of, um, you know, they've they've assessed DeAndre Swift and decided they didn't really want him to be part of their offense going forward. But like at the same time. Uh, if if you remember that first day of the legal tampering period or whatever, when uh, it was what, like 11 a.m. Eastern, that deals could be announced like mm -hmm. DeAndre Swift wasn't just like the first running back deal announced. He was one of the first deals of any sort announced in free agency. It was like 1101 and they were announcing that signing. Um, I think he was the first of any position. I don't remember anybody. Could very well be. Yeah. And was a head so scratcher Ryan, then, head scratcher now. Ugh. Yeah, Ryan Poles, though, was clearly targeting him. And you would imagine that Poles and his coaching staff were sort of on the same page with that one. So I, I would think they have some sort of plan for him. And even though the presence of Roshan Johnson and uh, Khalil Herbert is a little unnerving if you're an investor in DeAndre Swift, I still feel like Swift is going to get the, uh, you know, a plurality of the touches in this backfield, if not a, an outright majority. Yeah, I'm not like, again, like I think it's a fair ranking, but even at the position, like I look at some of the guys behind him in consensus, like I'd probably rather, rather wait around and take Tony Pollard. I'd probably rather take the talent swing on Jalen Warren. I'd probably rather wait on Brian Robinson. Like there's just other names that I like better, let alone the fact that, I, like I said, in that range of the draft, I'm more inclined to to take a receiver or, or, or like I said, if I've waited on one of the luxury positions. Um, let's go to the last running back here. Fitz, who you got? All right. Again, uh, we're, we're tipping sacred cows here today. And uh, this is one. Sometimes you have to tip your own sacred cow. So I'm <laughs> tipping a Green Bay sacred cow, uh, Josh Jacobs. And I, it's, I'm really surprised it's me making this case rather than Debro, since Debro is usually the one beating this drum. Um, I mean, the surface appeal with Jacobs is that he is predicted to be the lead back in what is an ascendant offense or, or what looks like an ascendant offense. Um, the thing is, I think a lot of the people who do NFL projections have Jacobs at around like 250 carries this season. But Packers head coach Matt LaFleur has not been a, uh, a monogamous running back guy. He's been a running back by committee guy. Um, Aaron Jones topped out at 236 carries during his five seasons playing for uh, Matt LaFleur. Two years ago, Jones played all 17 regular season games for the Packers, had 213 carries. That's about 12.5 per game. And I think we can all agree that Aaron Jones is light years better than A.J. Dillon. And yet, A.J. Dillon routinely would get 9, 10, 11 carries a game in games that Aaron Jones was playing. So um, also worth remembering that when LaFleur was the Titans offensive coordinator in 2018, Derrick Henry, healthy all season, 
had 215 carries, Deion Lewis at 155. That was a 24-year-old Derrick Henry being made a rotational back under Matt LaFleur. So uh, the Packers just spent a third-round pick on Debro's favorite running back in the draft, Marshawn Lloyd. And even though Green Bay, they did that even though the Packers had signed Jacobs and re-signed Dylan. So I, I think they, they have some sort of plan for Lloyd usage here in year one. Um, we just can't count on massive touch volume for Jacobs, and he is coming off a pretty bad season. Like, I still think he's a good running back, and, um, you know, when we recite his unimpressive 2023 efficiency totals, you know, we could just as easily go back to 2022 when he was tearing it up. But last year, minus 86 uh, yards rushing over expected. Fifth worst among all running backs. Um, and as Debro has written, Jacobs was 37th among qualifying running backs and missed tackles forced per attempt last year. 44th in yards after contact per carry. 12th highest stuff rate. Stuff rates. So some pretty bad signal there coupled with, you know, maybe committee usage. Um, I just think people should acknowledge the possibility that Jacobs is not the lead back people think he's going to be and is really more of the uh, chairman of a committee. You describing uh, Matt LaFleur's uh, running back usage as like non-monogamous makes me think of a guy who's like, honey, no, no, I'm not cheating on you. It's girlfriend by committee. <laughs> LaFleur <laughs> LaFleur is just, you know, pounding the table for open relationships. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um so Josh Jacobs is RB12 in consensus. Um everybody uh on the fantasy pro staff actually has him slightly lower than that except for Debro, you have him significantly lower than that. So you obviously are not going to disagree with Fitz here. Nope. I'm not going to The only reason I didn't take his name is because I felt like it was strong enough the other day with Andy Barron's on the show when I said I was avoiding Josh Jacobs like the plague. So I was very happy to see Fitzy uh, brought up Josh Jacobs on this show, but yeah, man, it's just I don't see the Parter piece like this workload that we're that everybody's forecasting for Josh Jacobs. I j just if we if you don't believe or or if you don't believe in the talent of Marshawn Lloyd or you don't want to follow the usage and stuff, just listen to the damn coaching staff, man. Like ever since they drafted Marshawn Lloyd, they have also come out and said. He is going to, and they've danced around this a little bit. They talked about, oh, with some of the things he showed at Senior Bowl, which they were discussing his past game utility, and he just, he balled out in Mobile. Like, he was just dusting linebackers uh, in the open field and out of the backfield there uh, in the receiving drills. And I just don't see the pass game role for Jacob. So it's like, okay, we, we Fitzy effectively poked holes in the early down workload based off of what LaFleur's done in previous iterations of his offense. Hell, even Green Bay, we can point to multiple spots with this. But also the passing down, it's like, okay, well, if you even wanted to glom onto that and say, well, Jacobs might not be as efficient as an early down runner, but we got the checkdowns, baby. Whoa! Like, it's probably not happening, man. Marshawn Lloyd, this team has talked about, he's probably going to be the preferred passing down back for Green Bay. All signs point to me drafting all the Marshawn Lloyd, and I will continue avoiding Josh Jacobs. If it burns me, it burns me. But I get this feeling it's not gonna.